So that's why now, low key, we're thinking about the whole sequel thing because. Yo, know, so, okay, I was, son, I was about to, <laughs> I, let me, I was about to, let me, let me, let me get in there, let me get in there. I'm all, I'm all, I'm all grown up. I all right, our guest today is a wonderful actor, writer, director, and musician. You may recognize him as Ren Stevens' arch nemesis, as your favorite imaginary friend in the scariest decom of all time, or more recently as Hunter the Struggling Artist in Venus as a Boy streaming now on Hulu. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ty Hodges. Ty, oh, what's man, up, what's my up, man? How, how you doing today, brother? Good, dude. How are you? Not bad. Not bad, man. I very recently learned that you are Bajan and Trinidadian. So I am your Caribbean brother. I'm Guyanese. Yes, you are. I saw that too. I was like, oh, man. There's a few times you get to, to find Caribbeans in the business. You know what I'm saying? That, it's that it's so them. rare, man. It's so rare. Yeah. yeah. No, and Guyanese, a lot of Guyanese friends. So we, we, we compare rice and peas, you know? Rice and peas. Facts, Everybody man. Everybody does things all so, the same food. Speaking of the food, man, I um I also recently learned that your family had a food truck called the Drippin' Chicken, and it looked amazing from everything I saw on the internet. The Yelp reviews were all praise. I'm wondering how come you guys shut it down? Uh, work. You know, it's hard. It's something that I like to do. It's just if I have to go do a project or something, it's kind of hard to maintain. Right. Because the you know, food, you know, Caribbean food. We did Caribbean fusion with like, like Mexican, Caribbean, and the food was a little bit complicated. So to have the food be at a certain level, we didn't have people that worked along with the food truck to trust the integrity yeah. of the food. So it's something that I'm going to do. I'm going to continue to do. We did actually one recently, a pop-up event in LA. It's called No Ego Sundays, and it's just a place where creators would come together and not have any opportunities to energy and just vibe out and cook and talk and so i'm gonna keep doing that and then hopefully have a restaurant restaurants and then Dope. i love cooking yeah all right well keep me posted the next time that happens man yeah you gotta come dude you gotta come check out you gotta get a, a jerk chicken taco we're about to do oxtail tacos yo bet that like, bro i'm there they're fired dude oxtail tacos we have the jerk chicken tacos we do this new thing called uh coca-cola barbecue tacos we just bug out it's fun it's like me my mom my dad and my brother and it's good family time and at our house we're always cooking like i'm always always cooking. that's what is, is your whole family out in la now yeah they're all out in la yeah from miami originally and then all in la now that's what's up okay so speaking of miami i want to take it back a little bit so you were born in dc yeah. You were raised in Miami, mm -hmm. and as I understand it, you were about 16 when you came out to L.A. for the first time. Is that correct? That's correct. So at that time when you came out, and I read that your your first gig here was the Janet Jackson video, Go Deep. Yes. Did you come out here solo, or was your family with you? I was solo, man. I came out here. Uh, how it all started was I grew up in the arts, like, since I was probably, like, nine, doing plays. And then a woman, you know, I was out in the mall. You always hear this story. Like, a woman saw me in the mall. My mom was just like, Oh, your son here that thought about doing little modeling and stuff. And my mom was like, no. I was like, yeah. And she was like, <laughs> send me a picture. So I sent like a school picture to her. And like I was playing football for like, for, you know, little like optimist football, optimist like little team. Right. And uh, I said, I sent a photo and she called back. And then I just started doing commercials. And then I went to art school. And then at 16, I got a Calvin Klein campaign for like this store in in, uh, in Miami, and that gave me the bug. I was on set, and then the commercial came out, the campaign came out, and it was uh we had a store called Durans. I don't know, if, you know, it's like an old school store, like okay. a Macy's, just in there all the time. And I was like little low key, popular in Miami, and then I convinced my principal, you know, parents. Um, to send me out to LA because I was going to a special school called New York Theatre Arts. And it was like basically um, a school for kids, like 300 and some kids went there. And then I convinced everybody because they were like, oh, I guess this kid can do something. Yep. So I went out for a month with like a alumni from my high school that was going to USC and graduate. And I said, yo, listen, I come to your house, I buy for you, I'll clean up, just give me a month. And he's like, well, how are you going to find an agent? I was like, I don't know, yellow papers. And I flew out here, got here at 12 a.m., got on the yellow pages, moved down every agency, got on the bus, and just started like getting lost in my, 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 my into this place. 
And the security guy was like, what you looking for? I was like, I'm looking for an agent. He was like, okay. So I gave him my headshot. He goes, no, no, I don't need your headshot. You should go upstairs. And I was like, okay, went upstairs. And uh, the agency at the time was Talent Group. And they signed me. They called my parents. And then they were like, we have auditions. And and so a month went by, I booked like a commercial. And a week before I was supposed to go back, I went to a cattle call for a John Jackson video. Right. And I went in there and got the video. And my, my mom had to come out. And then they told my mom, he was like, this kid should stay here. She had to call my dad, call my brother. I was like, guys, maybe we go to California. And then from there, Disney contacted me, and then the rest is like, I'm here. Wow, so man. So a- I, I respect the hustle so much of even at the age of 16. You got the hustle. I hear you. You got the hustle. <laughs> you got the, you no, the I, I, I appreciate you man so so it sounds like of course after that opportunity came up it sounds like your family was very supportive and i was wondering when you were first like all right i'm gonna go out to la and check this out was the reception warm to that or not really no no, no they all thought it was crazy like i never forget my uncle's like you're gonna go out there and like what you there what you going there for yeah <laughs> All of the, no one believed, but my, my parents, no, but my parents were like, this boy, he's been consistent and he, he wants to do this and we don't understand it. We bless him with the right morals and integrity and we're going to trust that he's going to go out there. Cause I was already doing it in Miami, you know what yeah. I'm saying? So to do it in California, when you've never been to California, are you born in California? Or nah, born, in born and raised in Queens, New York. Where, so you know, California is like this, if you ever been there, it's like this larger than you don't even know if it exists. You just know Safe by the Bell, you know stuff on TV. So as a kid from Miami, thinking about there from Caribbean family, yep. you know, of course, being American too, it just felt like it didn't exist. So it right. was it was my goal to say, all right, and my parents supported me, and some family members. I did have an uncle, uh, my uncle Colin, rest in peace. He believed in me, Auntie Alicia. You know, my grandfather, rest, like there were people that really, really believed in me. Yeah. However, there was some the family that did not necessarily believe in that. My cousins, you know, they believed in me. Janine and Sandra, Rachel, and prepared, like my aunt believed in me. But there was also the older generation of Caribbeans, I guess, that necessarily felt like this can't happen. And right. I was the only person in the family that was like, you know, in the entertainment business. I relate to you there a hundred. Yeah, you know, it always comes around though. It's all dependent on how much you have in your heart and how driven you are and that conviction that's inside of you. Even though people don't believe in the beginning, especially when it's your family, mm-hmm. it's beautiful when they do come around because when they do come around, you it's not you didn't have anything to prove, it's just you were, you are, you're being. And that's where the gift is, you know, you can't get mad when people don't believe. Yeah. You just got to keep going and, and, and see no later that it takes one person to believe in everyone else. To it. I, I agree, man. I agree. In those early days, you know, during your childhood and even in your teenage years, like even, even at the point when you came out here, where did you see yourself as an actor? As 16-year-old Ty Hodges coming out here, when you thought about what the future would be in 20 years, what were you thinking about in terms of your place in the industry? And what actors at that time were you looking up to that you wanted to emulate? You know what? I'm going I'm to keep it 100 when I came out here, I did it. All I knew is that I needed to come out here to, to be your own I knew that there were people that I watched on TV that I saw and I respected. And at the time, it was like smart guy and you yeah. know, like old school shows. I just knew that I, I needed to, to come out here and, and have a voice. And me and me when I came on the scene that I'm bringing something different. I didn't want to compete with anyone. I didn't want to be like anyone. Of course, Will Smith, you know, yeah. and Denzel Washington, the yeah. people that it's here, people that you look up to. But it's beyond just looking up to them because you're not trying to be them. You're just like all oh, these these guys or these artists or these women, these people, they have something and they're sharing yeah. like a truth that that keep that raises us all outside of our families. So when you do have that hour two hours of watching television and film, you know who impacts you. And so when I came out here, I didn't understand fame. I didn't understand none of it. I just understood like, yo, I love doing this. And right. yeah, you can be rich, you can be famous. My focus wasn't any of that. It was like, I want to have fun. I want to share my truth with the world, you know? Right, That's right. Kind of- 
No, I, if that I, makes I, that question. Man. That make that makes a lot of sense, man. That makes a lot of sense. It was pretty quickly that you were able to go and audition for Disney, and you got your part in Don't Look Under the Bed. No, that wasn't the first. That wasn't the first one. That wasn't the first one. Okay, what was the what was the first one? So I can tell you how Disney. I went to a concert, James Jackson and I a concert. Yeah. An executive that was there from Disney Channel was like, I was looking for you. We've been looking for you. So I was like, oh wow. She's like, come to my office Monday. We're doing this project. And yeah. I was like, okay. So I came. And I'll never forget, it was like me and a few other like famous actors. And I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. She just gives me some odd, like, read this. And I was like, all right. She's like, give me 15 minutes, come back and audition. And it was a show called Jet Jackson. Oh, amazing. hell yeah, hell yeah. They had the last episode, they were trying to bring on another character. And they literally thought of me and a bunch of other guys. And so I went on there, auditioned, and they called me two days later that we came to So that was the first, that was the first time Disney was getting a company with me. And then after that, they were casting for Double Thunder Bag, and it originally was not supposed to be a black character. So they just threw me in the mix. Yeah. And so I was just in, chilling and like, who's that? Where's that? Just going like, 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 Yeah. And just all the time. And then from there, even Stevens and from there, just started working more with Disney. Studios. So let me backtrack a second there. You said Janet Jackson invited you to the concert. So that means after y'all filmed the video, like she stayed in touch, like this kid is dope. I'm inviting him to the concert. Yeah, very sweet. Yeah. Their team sent me two great tickets and I sat there chilled and Wow. You know? That's a dope experience yeah, as a kid. Yeah, dude. And I've only I'm new in LA, you know, I'm three months, four months here. So yeah. everything is just kind of moving around me, you know, and I'm just showing up like excited to be here, you know? Yeah. All right. So you mentioned just now that the character of Larry Houdini was not originally black. I have read Kenneth Johnson say that Disney initially had a big issue with the kiss at the end of the movie because of that reason. And he fought for it to be in there. I was curious as to whether when that was going on, is that something that you were familiar with? Like during the process or was that all behind the scenes and you and Aaron were sort of like blissfully unaware of the quote unquote controversy that Disney had about it? Uh, yeah, I didn't know. We were just, we were just chilling. I knew it was on the call sheet. Yeah. Like, oh, we're going to keep me here. We're like, oh, we're going to kiss. We're going to kiss. I didn't know that it was even questioned. I never felt anything about race when I said. That's why it was crazy when he came out. It was that like three years ago? Yeah, pretty recently. Something? Yeah. I didn't even know, bro. I didn't know. And that I didn't let it even phase me like that. You know, I just yeah. was like. That's a testament to Kenny, man. That shout out to for him for fighting for the right thing. Because that's what he originally envisioned. And he didn't let them take it away. Yeah. And the producers, like the, all the producers, Jeff and David, they're huge movie producers now, TV producers. And so yeah. the fact that they are brilliant, amazing people. And they also were like, no, we're going to do it. Just shows that. It's, it's evolved. And then you look back and you're like, oh, that was the first Disney Channel interracial kiss. And you're like, what? Like, it's yeah. just amazing how far we came. And kudos to Disney Channel for rocking with it, you know, and being like, hey, let's do it. Like, this is what it is. And that made the movie because people love that kiss. Then you have mad people like, oh, and Larry and and Aaron kissed at the end. It's like, yo, that's son. Crazy, that that bro. that was that was iconic, bro. I mean, a hundred percent it was. And I have to say, I'm sure you're you've heard this a million times, but just I want to tell you from my perspective, that movie was so special because of your presence in it. You know, you were to that movie what the genie is to Aladdin, right? You're that every the, the, the entire cast is dope, but you know, you you brought that special something to that movie. Me and my sister would watch that shit. I taped it. I recorded it on a, a VHS tape. You know, commercials and all, and we used to watch that shit ad nauseum, bro, because it was like that was that was our movie yeah. so yeah yeah i'm curious as to if you were aware i've also read that after the movie came out there were a bunch of parents that felt it was like way too scary and they were sending disney hate mail and shit like that and that's why it didn't receive the same legacy treatment that a lot of other decoms receive is that something that you were aware of at the time yo like that those years of business for me yeah were so great like school right i left High school. I didn't get to have, you know, like imagine you leave high school yeah. in tenth grade. Yeah. You're just getting pop. You're just like feeling yourself. You know. And I went to art school, so it was even more like since I did it at four in the morning. Yeah. You know, I, I was so far away. I had to come home and plays, rehearsal. Hard work was like I was in it. I had discipline. I understood that. Yeah. So when I was working on Disney, I didn't understand the time of like editing to like go out. So I was just having fun, bro. Like, yeah. I literally thinking about nothing felt to me like entitled like i wasn't entitled when when people were 
you know, saying all those things. I remember I was still taking the bus because I was there when the movie came out. I was still going auditions by myself because my parents came out and worked. Right. And I was on the bus, never getting off the bus and then seeing like a poster of me like at the bus. And I'm like, man, this is crazy. You know what I'm saying? It yeah. was so, yeah. So, yeah. And so, like, I was not a part of the hype. So, when later you hear about all these things, the movie has such a cult classic that it's almost, to me, I can only imagine maybe at that time it wasn't, if it went crazy, I wasn't even, I wouldn't be able to receive it the way I do now. I'm mature, like proper, right? Like, right. really be able to grow up and understand I'm blessed to do this. I, I'm thankful to do this. It's about the art. It's not about me getting caught up in any idea of fame and all these things. All these, they come, you know what I'm saying? The thing is, we're human. We're all human beings. And that time for me being on the bus to getting out, seeing a poster of myself, I, no one could ever take that away from me. I'm sure other people have stories like that. But for me, yeah. it was grounding to, I don't even know what's going on, but yeah. I'm just here. And so looking back, I go online and people love this movie, bro. Like So much. They just, I, like, yo, Boogeyman, I'm like, yo, I'm, you remember? And they're like, yo, bro, my child. I wanted to borrow the day. I'm sitting there chilling, having a drink, drinking some wine, just left the meeting, just chilling. And the bartender keeps coming over and being like, mad cool. And I'm like, yeah, and he goes, bro, like, I don't do this, bro. But like, I mean, it's crazy. Like, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I see stars in here all the time, bro. But like, are you the guy for, are you Larry Houdini? Not even, like, and I'm like, yeah, I'm so surprised. I'm like, yeah, like, bro. And he's like giving me just wine all day and appetizers. And yo. I'm just sitting here with laugh. And he was like, yo, you're such a cool dude. Like, you're exactly how I needed you to be. And I'm like, but I don't even, I'm not even thinking about that. You know, yeah. especially like that position you have to go from being on TV as a child actor to that transition in adulthood. Yeah. And really wanting to be a creative, right? Like not writing on that. It's like you, I'm really so disconnected. However, when I do have those moments yep. and people own people are being like, yo, I'm showing this to my kids. Like I yeah. show this to my students. You're just like, oh, I'm just so grateful because everybody's having their experience. And I'm just thankful that I got to be a part of people's childhood in that way. And I'm Absolutely. excited to meet them, you know, now as an adult and still have that that same type of visual language or, or creative communication, you know? Yeah, man. It's, no, facts. You know? And it's it, it is really nice to see that you embrace it that way. Even some like the interaction that you just described, because to that person, just like me, that movie holds a special place, and the character holds a special place. And for you to just even just embrace it is is really nice, you know. Yeah, no, I mean for sure. That's why now, low key, we're thinking about the whole sequel thing because. Yo, know, okay, I was said I was about to. <laughs> let me, I was about to, Let me, let me, let me get in there. Let me get in there. Okay, before, okay, my bad. <laughs> before, be, no, man, I'm glad you brought it up. Okay, so uh, before I get there, let me let me ask this. Um, <laughs> I saw I saw an IG a pin post on your IG is you and Aaron Chambers reuniting last year, and I was wondering two things. Number one, like where was that at? And two, was that a happenstance meeting, or are y'all in touch like that? It was. We were really in touch. She's married with kids now, and I've been making independent films, so our schedules are just different. Uh, yeah, different. It was no, it was by, it was like scheduled and like a reuniting and to, you know, reunite and figure out. It was very appointing. Yeah, cool. It was, it was at a, a cafe. In LA? Yeah, in LA. Okay, okay. That's what's up. <laughs> That's what's up. The follow-up question to that then is, you pretty recently cryptically posted on your IG story. I saw it and I was wiling. A don't look under the bed poster and you put a, you added a two and you wrote something to the effect of, if you know, you know. And so you just mentioned something to me about sequel talks. Whatever you can share, please share. All I know is this. Even though the movie was taken off the air, even though I was, you know, they were questioning that we were breaking barriers, I really commend Disney for doing that. I also know that for a movie to have as much impact as it does with the millennial generation and for them to reunite that with their kids and like how scared it was and how my kids aren't scared, I'm just going to say that something special can possibly happen. And before I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be entertaining because I was always like, oh, I'm going to try Like, I want to, however, for my, I don't know. I feel like and you can correct me if I'm wrong. It would be interesting. And I really can't say a lot. I just am open to 
the idea now. And I think people will rock with it. I think, I know for me as a creative, no, I think, I mean, I would love to hear your feedback. I, I, I'm definitely open and it's something that I would love to do. And meeting Aaron and I, are, uh, us meeting our audience where we're at now in life and what, how that concept would feel and be, I really feel like it could be something really cool. And I'm very open. Well, I'll, I'll tell you my feedback, bro. I was, what do you think? I, what me, do you think? <laughs> you tell me you need a writer. No. You know, um, so if, uh, a few things. I think that movie just originally done was the ending was so perfectly set up for a sequel in many ways, right? E- even one thing that could have been done was you and Zoe going off and, and doing your own adventures. That was already set up. And I think that if Disney didn't get the backlash that they got, it might have happened then because Johnny Tsunami got it, Xenon got it, you know, there's other movies that got it. On top of that, though, we put that aside and we just look at what's happening now in the space of rebooting and doing sequels to franchises that were beloved by millennials in their childhood. It's happening on such a, a large scale right now that I think this is a more perfect time than any to do it because like you said that movie has a cult following people love it It has a special place in people's hearts and i think yeah that if you and aaron were down for it it's something that everybody would love to see you think so Uh, absolutely i'm seeing that as like it's honestly like cake think about the fact that okay you have disney plus as the option already like boom disney plus boom original movie let like let's go like there's not not even a question you know do you think it would be a good halloween movie or do you think it doesn't really be halloween Oh, bro, it should be. It should be. Because the original one was released in conjunction with Halloween. I remember that, you know, all the ads came out. I remember reading about it. I think it was like the September edition of Disney Adventures that came out that year, you know, and I was in I was in Queens just like, I was like, oh, shit, this movie looks dope, you know? Yeah, man, I, I think the time is right for it. Yeah, I feel I feel the same way, too. And as, as we're thinking about it, and Aaron's a mom now, and she loves being a mom, and our chemistry, we didn't see chemistry like that. It's we have a very, very unique chemistry. And literally when we had the audition and I remember they kept shuffling us and we were in the room and then all of a sudden all the executives were there like, Francis me, Larry, Larry me, Francis me. And then from there on we went to Utah and we made the movie. And so now I would be really, really curious to 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 be open to it. And not only that, I feel like we need it, you know, I feel like the world we need more i understand we have large imaginations now and it's attached to technology the thing is we don't really go within as much as we used to let's yeah. go outside and play kids really aren't even scared of this don't look under the bed this generation like people show their kids mad young and no one's scared right so the fact that adults like hit me up or like be like yo this still gives me trauma i'm like so funny how generationally this movie can impact multiple generations. Yeah. If we do it and I'm open to it, it just I want it to be done right. I want it to be done cool. I want it to be done fresh. Yeah. I want to feel like it's gonna have an innocence and a purity to it that the original did. Because yeah. the world needs it, yo. We need more love. We need more we need more fun. We need more like goofiness. And that's the thing we about- do, man. I think also and this is something I'm going to touch on very shortly here, but the beauty of it being done now at this point in life, and I guess, again, I don't know the shot callers and the powers that be, but now you could very much be involved in writing and directing that project and making it maybe what it needs to be, because it sounds like you know what it needs to be and you have that experience now. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny, like, you were here fishing, man. You, you need to, you need to you <laughs> here. I, uh, <laughs> Larry is somebody that I don't know if I, uh, let's just say I don't know a lot, right? Let's just say no this. Larry is somewhere inside of me, and I'm excited to like meet him again. And I don't, I don't, I'm not saying like it's so funny because this is always like a thing when people talk about stuff that they're trying to have tape around. It's like I'm, I want to be honestly real and pure. It's just you. a character that I know that the world would embrace, and however that comes about if i am to direct it or write it larry's my priority because i saw and i see how people relate to him and i also know how i relate to him yeah and i also know like being fresh from miami a kid with a dream to play a role like that and still have to go into the industry with knowing like you know i played a role that broke race barriers that broke yeah. you know stereotypes 
And like you said, to reference his genie in the, you know, like Aladdin, that's like, man, that's like a gift because we all know what that felt like. Just yeah. like a being that you could just could relate to. And that's all we want, right? Like yeah. people just want a person in their life to be themselves and not judge and not care and just have like an abundance amount of love. Yes. An abundance of freedom to express themselves. And we live in such a judgmental, opinionated world, not because people are mean. Yeah. It's just we have this technology, we have social media. So that everyone could say something and everyone is judging. Mm-hmm. And I just try to in my own real life where it's like I don't want to judge. Like life, everybody wakes up every day. Like and when you're an adult, you wake up every day yeah. to go on being a better human being. Yep. Loving your loved ones. And then paying bills. And then just going out in the car. Yeah. Like getting back the little simple things in life that we tend to forget because everything's coming at us so much, because you have five different personalities on social media. Yeah. You know, you're back to that. You on Facebook, you're this way, on Instagram, you're this way, TikTok, you're this way. And then you gotta relate to the people you love that know you. Yep. But then they also know you, but you're also growing, so there's space there. So all of these dimensions and we're multi-dimensional human beings i yep. do believe that me moving forward and creating in the world disney was a blessing for me because i got to just be free yeah and i know your kids necessarily didn't have what we had as mm-hmm. millennials so now feeling like a responsible creative being yeah i want to write interesting stories that aren't for kids however i do have niece I have little cousins and now yeah. I feel huge responsibility to create for them too and give them what I had, what you had, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And just bring back a little more love, a little bit more freedom. And like, let's just connect. We're all different. You know, we all, yeah. we, we're not supposed to all be the same. Yeah. However, what if we all be in a room and connect you know, how, or be on TV and be like, yo, I don't feel any barriers with this content I'm watching. I'm not reminded that, yo, oh, this is a story about this type of person and this in this box is like, no, I want to watch you and be like, I don't really care what you are. I just love everything you're about. And and that is where I feel this movie and this role could be and do, even on a, on another level with yeah. stronger technology and, and all the knowledge that Aaron has of being a mother and I mean, those are these two interesting characters that come on TV. I haven't seen any characters like it to come back to an audience that now has a family or that now is in a position yeah. where they wanted to be that nostalgia. Your words are uplifting me right now, bro. They're uplifting me right now. I'm very excited for whatever potential is is here. Yeah, um, come be and- here, man. Here. Son, you don't, you ain't got to... Right you ain't got to ask me twice. Well, the concept <laughs> ready, bro. Yo, it's like Larry Houdini sitting down with 10... You know, talking about being an imaginary friend. Yeah, you know, like, bro. It is. So you give it. I'm goose bumping right now, bro. <laughs> goose bumping right now. Is that, a, is that another millennial joke. That's <laughs> another one, right? You just touched upon something that I'm going to bring up shortly too, because uh, you were talking about so many aspects of social media, and I feel like that was. It's interesting that you brought it up in the way that you did, because I feel like that was a theme that you were really examining in Venus as a boy. I'm going to get to that uh, in a second. I wanted to ask you just real quick. Then it wasn't that long after "Don't Look Under the Bed" that you got your role on Even Stevens as Larry Beal. Was it purely a coincidence that Larry Beal's name was Larry? I don't even like, that was another role where, and that confused a lot of people like, why did you play Larry and Larry? And I'm like, I, I don't know, it just happened. Just happened, yeah. Well, I think you're probably right. It probably was I'm just- like Larry, I don't know. Is, is that a thing? Do I look like right. a Larry or something? I don't think I look like a Larry. It's a coincidence, but it's nothing deeper than, it was just another project. You know, deeper than that, right, okay. Theory. When you were cooking with um, Christy Carlson Romano, she was finally remembering that you guys went to, you took her to her first frat party. So you guys did that together. I was wondering, what was your favorite memory from that time on that show? I think our life outside of filming and how much fun we had, Mm-hmm. and hang out on the weekends. I used to go surfing in the morning and then go to set with the group. The musical episode was mad fun because I got to expose other creative stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, the whole experience, again, was a good warm-up to what I'm about to do. Yeah. Fast forward to 2006, Miles From Home. Was that mm-hmm. your first time 
directing and writing yeah what was your inspiration at that time to branch out into writing and directing because i noticed that now you do it very often i mean you're almost exclusively doing that i think around that time i did a hillary duff movie and then i did a material movie. girls material girls yeah material girls and i did a, a american national movie uh-huh and i thought you know, I'm working. I'm also like playing a lot younger than my age. All my friends went away to prestigious art schools, and I've always wanted to go to a prestigious art school. And so at this time, everyone like graduated from GDI NYU. I'm this guy that's playing like a lot younger than I am, and I see there's a pattern in me being like the funny guy. Yeah, and I'm cool with that because I'm I love to be funny in person. However, just something inside of me felt like this is going to not be good for me to keep doing and doing over and over again. And I also was working for so long that I didn't, I had to get back to my identity and figure out really what I want to do, how I want to do it. And, and the money and all this stuff is great. And I want to do this. I just need to figure out, you know, I want to contribute more. Right? There's more, something more inside of me to experience. So I went away to New York and hung out with all my friends that I left in high school and just was like, you know, just living, just living. Really. Just this was uh, and you're from New York, Williamsburg, right yeah. when it was getting into you know, like Brooklyn and just understanding how to kind of do things and not have somewhat such responsibilities to like have to wake up, but just be human, like figure out, OK, you've been working consistently. How can you if you want to do this again, you got to get more. You got to experience more life. So I did that. And when I was out there, uh, one of the executives that I was working with, I was like a mentor. She's like, what's up with you? And I'm like, I love this. I just I just need a little break. And she's like, okay, well, what are you thinking about doing? And I was like, so I was talking to my family about it. My parents were very supportive. They were like, well, if you don't want to do this anymore, then, you know. And I was like, yeah, it's not that. And then my dad was like, why don't you just write? Why don't you just direct, you know? Why don't you just try that? And I was like, yeah, we're writing. I mean, I don't know where to start to write a script. And he's like, well, you wrote a script last time. You know, you were like 15. And I was like, oh, yeah, I did. So I found this program that I went to uh, when I got back from New York, and it was a screenwriting program. And I went to it, and it was like six weeks, and I learned how to write a script. And what I did was I said, I'm going to write a script, and I'm going to write some Indian, like something that I could like feel like I'm not playing like the happy funny guy mm -hmm. writing some like real raw stuff and at the time spiritually i was going through a lot of understanding because i grew up very much in the church and i grew up in faith i was realizing like how is my faith working to my life now and i was realizing i was getting more i don't want to say disconnected however i was just questioning my faith i was questioning life and so when i started writing the script it was very very different, very dark. And I was like, yo, what's coming out of me? You know, but I was just like writing it. I took my money and I was like, I'm gonna make a movie. And it didn't make sense to anyone. And my agent at the time was like, no, are you okay? Like, you on drugs? What's up? And I'm like, no, I'm, I just want to. And they're like, what, you don't want to audition? And I'm like, no, I just want to take a break and I'm gonna make a movie. They're like, but you don't know how to make a movie. And I'm like, I know I don't, but I'm gonna do it. So I gathered all my friends together. And, and, and sometimes in life, let me say this to him, Sometimes in life, your ego can block a lot. Mm. And a lot of that comes with the ego and mainly it's fear. And that's how you can identify ego because fear comes. And sometimes ego is coming from other people. Yeah. And so at that time when everyone was telling me, don't do it, I had the script and it didn't make sense. I ran into my buddy that I grew up with in Miami when I was 12 years old. And I was on a date with this girl and he's like, he looks at me and he's like, and I'm like, come on. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, what's up? So I feel bad because the girl I was on a date with, I was like so happy to see him. But we in a movie theater. I'm like, and he's like, well, what are you doing here? He goes, yo, I came out here to film movies. I was like, word? He goes, yeah, I want to be a DP. I was like, yo, I just wrote a script. He's like, let me read it. And he read it and we sat down at a coffee shop and he was like, so how much do you have? I was like, I have this. And he goes, all right, well, we can go ask my mom and we can we can, we can, like, I'll get a camera. We can shoot on this. And literally that one coffee meeting, we were making this movie. And then the actress, uh, Megan did that started. And I was, she's like, what are you doing? We're in her, we're like, I was like, you don't make a movie. She's like, let me read it. And she goes, I want to be in it. And she was like, I want to produce. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, well, how do you produce? I'm like, I don't know, just buy food for the crew, you know, like have schedule. And literally, bro, it was like this kind of like organism and this labor of love to where we were making something that we weren't expecting success from. We were just being. Yeah. And I, and, and that's when I got charged and be like, I love filmmaking. 
And also learn, you start having so much respect for the industry and you start, you start having so much respect for producers and people that put stuff together because it's, it's hard work. And so just as an actor, when you show up and you dress when you're there and I mean, especially when you're young, you, want to, you think everyone's there just for you. And so that's where kind of narcissism, narcissism can develop. Facts. And then you, you're just adapting to showing up. And so when I made Miles from Home, when I made Miles from Home with everyone, it felt like this, oh, like now I understand this business and now I have so much more respect for everyone. And I always did, because, you know, going to a career that you have manners. Facts. The thing is, just another level. Like I was like so gracious to be like, yo, so yeah, man, made that movie. We didn't even know what we were doing. Cut it together, put it out in the world, and then people started calling me a director. And then from there, I just started going and going and going and going. It's so interesting that you had people saying, like, for example, your agent at the time saying, well, you don't know how to make a movie. And that's so crazy because nobody knows how to do anything until they do it. That's the only way to fucking figure it out. You just have to do it, right? Like, people ask, how can I achieve the goal of more pull-ups by doing fucking pull-ups? I mean, that's it, yep. right? Yeah, that's dope that you took that plunge, man. And it brought you all the way up to where you are now. And I want to talk about Venus as a boy a little bit. That movie had a serious cast, man. You had Olivia Culpo in there. You had Bai Ling. It was an amazing cast. I, I wonder, when you do an independent film like that, what was the casting process like in terms of when you wrote the movie? Did you have them in mind? And or were you yourself in involved in the casting process. I got to give a shout out to our amazing cast director, Artie Day. She's incredible. When I wrote the movie, whenever you write a movie, the characters speak to you for me. So it's a vibe. It's never a race. When I'm writing, I'm just like, so usually when I audition people, I don't have a race unless mm -hmm. it's like a family member to cast a child to meet with like the parents. This point of view, when I wrote the movie for the lead girl, I was literally, you're going to laugh. I was trying to make a love jump. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to make, I don't know if you know that movie, but I was trying to make yeah. something romantic and something people of color, you know? Yeah. So Olivia was not thinking who I was going to cast at all. And there was like two other actresses of color that we were going to go for the scheduling kept conflicting. And so Arlie just went there with us. She just was like, yo, we're going to find it. We're going to find it. We're going to find it. And so our first target was casting the lead girl because that was important for the relationship. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Ruby. And yeah, Ruby. It was like a certain type of energy we were looking for. The first person we cast was Trace Lissette. Which she okay. has in the movie coming out. Uh, the lead character, I wanted to cast Trace because I wanted to start exercising my creativity with not putting race, gender, all these people in boxes. I, I don't know. I think our generation just likes people yep. and gets along with some people like to hang out in clicks. However, I wanted to, it was very intentional for me to say, all right, let's do a movie like Venus is a Boy, which that doesn't make sense, but it's a Bjork song. Mm -hmm. And then let's, at that time, I was really writing from a vulnerable place and being like, we don't see stories like this for people that look like me. Yep. And then the next level was like, okay, the best friend, who should the best friend be? And I was like, Hendrix. We casted her. She was like, you're on board. And then we so like, eight months was looking for a Ruby. I went to to the gym and I was in the spin class with a trainer and he knows every day I come to the gym, I'm like, Cassidy and I'm like, nah, I'm, <laughs> I'm in a spin class. My casting director hits me up and she's like, I think we found your Ruby. And I'm like, okay. And she's like, just look at her tape. So I didn't know who Olivia was. I didn't wow. know who she was. Yeah. Social media. So I'm like, oh, she's a lot of followers. So I go to the trainer. I'm like, hey, do you know this girl? Was, oh, yeah. She, oh, she's bad. I'm like, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> Look, and I'm like, yo, mad people follow her that I didn't know follow her. Yeah. And so it was good. We scheduled a, a meeting and then got her in. And then Bai Ling, I've always been a fan of Bai Ling. I met with her in the lobby of a, a hotel, me and my music partner. And she's like, I love this script. I want to do it. I was like, cool. I don't know if you've ever been in that space, but it's very much movie making is that, man. It's a flow. You get into flow and then you, you find the right synergy because that's the DNA that goes into the movie. So casting is so important. And, I, oh, yeah. and I'm still trying to, you know, I'm still trying to master that aspect of writing something and then having to cast it. I feel that, man. I feel that. In the movie, you seem to want to explore the theme of social media a lot. You know, obviously, Ruby's an influencer. She's big on the idea of being social media famous. And your character, Hunter, is not so much and almost seems to resent that idea, or at least it, it seemed that way to me. Do you think that social media has become a good or a bad tool for creators? Great question. And I feel that that has changed a lot, my perception. I honestly think it's brilliant. I also think anything that's great, there comes responsibility. And for me, 
I'm not good at it. I wish I was good at social media. However, people that are really good at it, I admire them because they have a fearless fearlessness about it. They're not in their head about it. My process is very intimate. If I'm writing something or if I'm going here, I don't care for people to know where I'm at. Not because I, I'm overly private, even though I'm private, it's just that relationship. I admire the people that can do it. I think it's brilliant. I also think that, it, it, like I said, it comes back to having a responsibility because everything you put out there, someone's watching. And so it just takes the the, the person watching, receiving it, to then take that back and apply it to their life and it may not fit. So if I'm a guy that does crazy stunts and do, kids, go out there and jump off a rock, you know, you have to be mindful. However, there's a lot of people that do it in a very, very great way. And it's, I try to limit my idea of judgment because I just want people to be great and be happy with themselves, however it is. And one day, sometimes I'm like, yo, I should engage more because I do love people. I do love community. And what best way to have community is through social media. Big facts. I just have to found that maybe it's around the corner man i fully agree with what you're saying there it's definitely something that could be used for good or evil just like any powerful tool out there but i love to focus on the positive effects that it has and i mean even right now right social media is what allowed us to connect yeah and you're great at it like you, oh thanks you, man i'm I, I wish i was better but thank you no but you're legit at it why because you're honest and you're just you're, you're not in your head about it and i'm sure you know with your wife you're like oh i should do this again you know like but the, it always comes off pure it always comes off honest it always comes off organic and, and that to me is a gift right like that's a talent that's a skill set that you've learned and and you really are doing it and approaching it in a healthy way so people can get into you and i know like if i wanted to wake up tomorrow and be like yo i'm gonna go far on social media i yeah. know i could it's just trying to figure out that right process. And, all, you know, I've been making these independent films back to back to whereas by the time I want to be social, I'm not thinking to be like, hey, you know, what's up, guys? Yeah, like, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get so much into, like, the work to where it's like, I'm like, yo, I just want to chill. I, I love people, yo. Like, I love people. Like, I'm So when, you, when you're doing these projects, such as Venus is a Boy, right? Once the movie's done now and you've created something that you're happy with, now the next phase of distribution and promoting it. What is that part of it like for you to get it onto Hulu, to get distribution? And do you like it? Do you like that business aspect of it? I really wanted to watch Charlie Trevor and a girl, Savannah. I wanted to watch a girl like Grace. Like, I can't find them anywhere. I love it. It's another skill, though. It's a, Venus is a Boy taught me that because most of the films that I did before outside of Miles from Home I was I wasn't a part of the distribution aspect I was the talent Venus is a boy the movie was interesting because a lot of people told me again no one wants a love story no one wants a drama and that's the thing I say this to everyone people tell you no one wants this no one knows right and that's the beautiful thing is that we all don't know like you don't know we don't know we don't know who's gonna be the hottest thing we don't know it's funny that when it changes because a lot of people that are successful right now, they didn't think it was going to be anything. So for me, Facts. beyond being a star, like, we all should feel that way. Like, whatever you want to do in life, you should be able to be like, okay, you, you don't know. Okay, cool. Well, I, I know for this point. Mm -hmm. So with Venus, I was having so much pushback with the idea of making a movie this way because no one really cares about, in their mind, who cares about being an artist? But I'm like, yo, everybody wants to be an artist. Everyone yeah. wants to have a voice. Yeah. And everybody doesn't want to be put in a box. Yeah. So... I have to stay through with that message. And to your point, the distribution aspect or the festival aspect is such an important process in putting out a movie because it's all about how you present it to the world. It's all about when you drop the first trail. It's all about when you drop the first poster. And I didn't know all those things. So I was blessed with a great team around me to kind of assist me with that. And then when we got into Tribeca, it kind of gave us a lot more respect Yeah, because people were like, oh, okay, isn't Tribeca cool? And then after Tribeca, I did Afro Pump because the music started, the music was an experiment, right? So the music, Afro Pump picked up the music mm -hmm. and was like, yo, do you want to go tour? And I was like, tour, word? Uh, let me figure this out. Yeah. So that movie is interesting because it's all about learning new skill sets, respecting them. When I was just into the artist phase, I really was like, now nah, the business, someone could handle that. However, now I'm like, it's not that I have to control things. I just should know. I should be aware. Yeah. I should know what's happening. I also, I also need to be humble enough to let people that do that, do that. So that's yeah. when the distribution, you get a publicist, they go, okay, well, let's put it on letterbox and let's do this. And then the Hulu situation came out. I was, it's funny because again, I experienced a level of, no, the movie, you know, not going to do this. Da, 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 da. 
And I was in Paris working on another independent film mm -hmm. I was telling you about. And on set, one of my producers, Venus's boy, he was out with me in Paris and he goes, yeah, come here. I was like, what's up? He goes, you know, so he's got to offer me who we And mind you, I'm on another set and I'm like, this news that we've been waiting for, we're like, okay, cool. I had to let, and I went back to set and then I was working, working. And later I thought about it on a break and I was, I just had so much gratitude because I was like, yo, I just handled that. Like, like if I was in LA not doing anything and waiting and being like, yo, it's not good enough for this and that, which we all do. If you're a creative person or just anybody, we're always questioning ourselves, right? Always. The thing is, like, you know, we're always questioning ourselves, right? Like, but the thing is you're doing it. You want a podcast right now, you have Matt, you get what I'm saying? Like you just do it. So when I took that break, I was like, I went back to him. I was like, yo, did you just say that we had an offer from Hulu? And he goes, yeah. And I was like, yo, that's how I was going to feel. Yeah. I was, it's not that I'm on, it's, it's not that I'm not excited about it. It's like, yo, like I, you just got to keep moving and you got to have faith and you got to keep believing because that's the last moment I was thinking of hearing good news because I was already in where I felt like I needed to be. Yeah. So that's, that's the original thing where you're moving and you're moving with good energy. And this Paris movie was such an adventure for me and experience for me. I'm like, Oh wow. This thing I did over here is now having a life. And so let me, yeah. it's a process because throughout all the process, when you're creating, you're going to always experience rejection, success, people telling you you're great, people telling you not. And so if you could just find that cool balance, right? Like everyone has an opinion, but once you give that out, that, that once you give everything out into the world, that piece of art, it's not yours anymore. However, you know that it's going to land somewhere and it's going to land right where it needs to land, how it needs to land, because your intentions were that. Yeah. If your intentions are just put something out to get famous, then that's going to be how it lands for you. Yeah. You know, so this side of the business is very different. And I'm glad I'm on basically. That's what's and up, man. You catch me in questions, bro. I'm like, <laughs> I wasn't ready for it. Sorry, man. I thought it was no, I love it. I appreciate it. I feel like I'm talking to a friend that's talking about real stuff instead of like a, what's great about podcasts. And, and the reason why I'm glad that I, that I did this is because we all are trying to figure it out. And sometimes people forget that part. Facts. Where they're at in careers, you know? Yeah, man. You were in Paris working on a project and I was curious as to if you wanted to share anything about it with us at all at this junction or if it was still very much under wraps. No, I love this movie. I'll just say this. I had an idea to make a movie in Paris. I put it together all through social media, which is crazy because I just said I'm not good at social media. Mm -hmm. And it was my first time going to Paris and I worked with an entire French crew, all French actors. You speak French? No. Oh, wow. So, okay. No. You, you, you was really like breaking barriers then communicating. Yeah, I was just, a lot of artists went to Paris that I respect and they spent time there. And have you been in Paris before? I have just once, I think maybe for a day and a half. Next time you go feel the pulse of Paris, not as a tourist, like Bet. complete local. Because a lot of creative people that I respect have gone there. And so for me, this again, it's like, if you if you look back at your life, when you feel those moves to move, I'm sure you felt to move to LA, it felt like I gotta move to LA. Yeah. Like, this is what I gotta do. I mean, so for me, Paris making this movie, even how it happened, it's a long story how it happened. I went there and it, and it was it was an adventure, bro. And I'm so proud and excited of this movie for the world to see it because it's very, very different. Yeah. It's a different style, different. I shot it different. Yeah, I just I just locked picture today. Dope, so, man. Congrats. Yeah, man. Thank you. I just locked picture today and now it's off to a sound and the movie's 50% in French. So I have to do subtitles and, and all these different things that are just like really fun and cool and and now it's the part that you're asking about distribution and festivals. And so, you know, I'm going to take a little break and then yep. figure that out. You can, I can say the title though. Yeah, yeah. It's called Love Me in Paris. Love Me in Paris. All right. We're going to be on the lookout for that. You got to come to the premiere. You and your wife, bro. You got to come to the premiere and, and see, see the movie. Let me know, man. I'm, I'm always down to show love, bro. Let me know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's if we do it in Paris, then you can just... Get some cool points for taking your wife to Paris. We, you know, we'll see, see where the movie goes. Yeah, bet, man, bet. I'm excited for it. I want to ask you about British Brooklyn, man. It seems like your alter ego as a musician, as British Brooklyn, you did a track for Venus as a boy. That was dope. And you've got a few other original tracks out there. When did you start doing music? And how would you describe yourself as a musical artist? And is that something that right now you're taking as seriously as you're taking acting, writing, and directing? How the music thing started, I grew up in a musical theater. And so I was always kind of singing wasn't confident in my voice because at that time r&b's like if you don't sing like usher 
somebody right, right. Like, singing musical theater, you know, was like, you know, and then I was like, all right, I, I don't vibe with this anymore. And so fast forward, right before Venus is a boy, I decided to buy a guitar and I said, all right, New Year's resolution, I'm buying a guitar and I'm learning how to play guitar. And I bought a guitar and I was playing around with chords, Nirvana chords, and that's that song, Am I Okay Went Out. And I realized it was a check-in because I started writing out of taking notes in my notes and my iPhone and making yeah. them into songs. And my brother's a producer and he heard me playing chords. He was like, yo, it's kind of fire. And I was like, really? So he goes, in the studio. And he just got on his drums. And Am I Okay was the first song. It's in the of Boy too, mm -hmm. uh, that he started playing. And then we recorded it. And then he was like, yo, I think there's something here. Let's just keep making music. And at the time I was writing Venus is a Boy. So I literally was like writing music that I was feeling real and then later putting it into a movie. And then we put the EP together and put the songs in. And then Afro Pump reached out. And it was just like this kind of thing where I was bashful about it. And then people were like, yo, this is kind of hard. And I was like, word? And so after going on the Afro Punk tour, I was like, okay, I want to do this now. So I'm working on the next EP now for the movie, the Paris movie. And I'm definitely, I'm definitely taking it more serious mm -hmm. and going to put more into it. Because music is a universal language and there's so Facts. much I want to say. And in movies, you really can't be as abstract. And with music, you can be completely abstract, completely free, say whatever you want. And making music with my brother and we're producing now, That that's our movie. Our first movie is Will You Love Me in Paris? Now, Love Me in Paris. And so thank you, Music and Film. That's, that's, our, that's our company. He's music on film. And to be able to create with my brother, especially on um, music, has been an incredible experience because who can, you know, you trust your siblings, right? Like you, you just feel so. I'm really excited about jumping into music and how far that goes. I'm just gonna embrace it, you know? That's yeah, dope, man. Fun. It's really cool to hear that you're that you're doing music for your own movies. It's a goal of mine too. Earlier, you brought up Will Smith as someone you looked up to, and that was big for me too, right? I grew up heavy on Will Smith. I have that equivalent passion for music, for rap, and for acting, and I was always like, all right, man, that's the holy grail for me. If I could, if I could star in a movie and have my track in that movie, the way that they did Men in Black and Wild Wild West and, and that type of stuff. So the fact that you had Venus as a boy and you had your own track in it and you, you're making this new movie and you're going to have your own music in it, I think that's amazing, bro. Yeah, and it's weird because these aren't things that are planned. You know what I'm saying? They just happen. Yeah. And maybe I don't know your personality. I don't know how you are. That's where when you can surprise, when you get surprised and you just roll with it mm -hmm. and you know what you want, that's when you're having fun. Because the Facts. music in this movie is completely different. I mean... I don't know if you heard all the songs on the British Brooklyn EP. It it's, it's, comes off like it's dark, but it's happy, right? Yeah. You, you create where you're at. And so there's something cool about doing things under different names or not having the expectation attached to it. Because the minute you have the expectation attached and you're like, yo, this is what I did, this is what I did, this is what I did. Mm -hmm. Now you're like, okay, well, what does that mean? Versus like, I'm in the incubator. I'm constantly... So yeah. when you, you do have everyone looking at you, when you do have everyone expecting you to be this thing, you can always surprise yourself and then surprise them. So yeah. nothing's ever stale. Yeah. And then when it's honest, like when you're honest about it, you don't even you're not even tripping because you're like, oh, okay, you don't like it, it's cool, but it was honest. Yeah. And that's the that's the sweet spot. And that's why with this EP, I'm just having fun with my brother. Like we're just and my brother's really, really judgmental on music. He's been very much like if it's not hitting That's good. Then it's it just move, moves on. Yeah, that's dope, man. Would you feel comfortable sharing with us what the origin of the name British Brooklyn is? Yeah, the Brooklyn part is because I spent time in Brooklyn. That's why I feel like I, I grew up. Bet. As like my transition from being a child actor to like being a creative person. And then British being Caribbean, Bayesian, Trini, and American. We're the British, you know, the queen. And so I realized that as much as I had like this raw being inside of me that I just want to like, just raw, when I think of Brooklyn, it's like that and what Brooklyn was back in the day in the art scene, to then have this side of me that just very morals, integrity, like proper each and knife and fork, you know, yes, mommy, yes, daddy, oh, do I? you know, like all of this yeah. proper, proper way of being, that's the balance of British Brooklyn for me. The duality with being everything you want to be, but just authentically being that, you know, like having two sides, which I think a lot of people have two sides. People just are uncomfortable with. But even though British Brooklyn is my alter ego, they're each other's alter ego too. So That's what's uh, up, man. That's dope. Earlier, you touched upon 
hearing no and you could find another opportunity in that and that brings me to a question that i want to ask in 2016 i read on deadline that you had a show called famous that you had written you had ralph farquhar attached which is amazing there was a 10 episode order and then nothing so i mean i know how this business works i know that obviously something happened there and and that happens to a lot of series but i'm just very curious as to what happened if if you're comfortable sharing what happened in this situation because it just sounded from what i read like the combination just sounded like it would be a wonderful show i'm glad you asked that because that's how Venus is boy happened that show was so special to me it was the first time that i was getting you know being an executive creating a show for fox was huge yeah for me i I didn't know I could do that. And so doing it and having the blessing and the support and the validation of Ralph because he's television legendary, you know, it was a good, it was a good lesson. And, and, and it taught me that I could do it and I could do it again. And I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it a lot. And, and I'm, and I'm matured from that. The one thing I tell you, bro, that really had me understand people more mm-hmm. is when that happened, and I didn't even, again, I didn't know the power of trades. I didn't know that everyone's going to call you and be like, congratulations, congratulations, congratulations. And I'll tell you this, there's people that called me to congratulate me. Mm-hmm. And then there was people that called me to say sorry. And when I realized that those different type of people, the people that would celebrate your success or the people that would celebrate your failures was really interesting for me because I, I didn't want to judge them because I was processing myself. Mm-hmm. And that and got me through that, of course, was having faith, my family, and then knowing, like, okay, I, I know, I know I needed to learn this. I need to learn how to do this. Mm-hmm. And I was able to process it in a super healthy way. And out came Venus as a boy because that's, that's, I was like, all right, well, TV is a little bit different. And I grew up on TV. Let me just go make a movie real quick on the guy I am today or what I'm thinking about. Right. So it's a great show. And I, and I do feel like it could come out again. That's the idea I had. And I know I'm just going to keep creating more ideas. Yeah. Well, so, well, that's a dope. First of all, amazing that even right there was your ex- was an example of you taking a no and turn it in turning it into something else but even on top of that what you just mentioned of it still has potential as a show i mean fucking pitch this show bro because that the, there's so many fucking avenues right now and i think it needs to be on it needs to be on air yeah it, and it's a show that deals with fame in a whole different way this show was we shot a sizzle reel for it so that's how i was able to get picked up and that sizzle reel was just like people were like yo this is something different it's timing it's also the way we mature i'm sure I, I I was very mature. I think it went back to self work. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm being that being an executive and creating a show at any age is hard. Being in that position and then learning it, and now I'm like, all right, now I have ten shows on my board. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like yeah, that's where I'm like, okay, no, don't worry about it. like that. That's just you, Caribbean. You know, like when your family comes to America and they're like. They make that joke. Jamaicans have seven jobs, while Bayesians have ten because they own the farm. And Chinese have a hustle and this and that. And Guyanese, one of my mom's best friends is Guyanese, so I know a lot about Guyanese culture. Yep, it's like we, there's no stopping. No. Like we're going. So my whole thing is, I'm just excited to to be like, okay, now I have all these shows because I've got smarter, understand the knowledge, understand how to run a writers' room, how I want to run a writers' room, and I'm a part of the generation that's coming up. Yeah, so man. I'm very pleased for that, but now it's like I can really rock out and I can be like, all right, okay, cool, what's up? Like, and understand because I never forget when the show, when they pulled the show and everyone was calling apologizing me. I never forget I was in the car. It was funny, I was talking about this with my mom the other day. I was in the car and she was with me and my screen popped up and my phone was just ringing back to back. And I'm like, yo, to one of my boys, I was like, and I call him my boys because he's the homie, but it's like, you got to know how to position your friends so there's always peace so mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying and i was like it's funny he didn't call me to congratulate me but he's calling me to say sorry like he cares however i knew he knew because he was yo ty sold the show you heard that ty sold the show. it was you were the main cheerleader over there you never called to congratulate me i saw you out and you were like yo good shit i'm like cool but then you call me make an effort to call me right to Make me feel bad for myself. It's not even to judge him; it's to say I don't want to be that dude. And I yeah. and I always try to reflect in the brain when I am approaching other people with the negativity. Like, yo, you heard somebody said this about you. It's like I never like to partake in those feelings. I only want to bring nothing but 
positivity to people. And if there's some friction between friends, we can have that conversation. The thing is, in this business, people are always watching you. They're going to mm-hmm. watch your highs. And, watch your and if you can just keep it cool with good people that really, really genuinely rock with you, they love you, Bet. they're not going to pay attention to you. They're going to find you like, no, it's all good. You're, you're too good for it. But like, mm-hmm. They why the places where they don't want you. I'm discovering more and more. I want to be that great wine that's like getting better because when everybody is watching you to deliver, I want to make sure I'm being responsible with that because it's so hard not to be. It's so hard to get caught up. When you were looking at life and looking at others, like not to get to, but we're all connected. We all got to like care for each other more. You don't get caught up in all of those things. And, you know, it's hard because when you have some sort of notoriety or people can Google you, you can't be as like, no, come to the crib, have some food, you know? Yeah. However, you can still be of service when you go into the grocery store and be like, thank you, know, like we can still yes, operate sir. with people no matter how successful you are. You Big know? facts. Big That's facts, man. Cool. Yeah, yeah, man. If you could bring back one thing from the 90s, what would it be? I'm going to do three because I like threes. Okay, bet. TGIF. Yo. That brought family together. Yeah, it did. And it, it didn't make people watch things on their own time, streaming wise. Right. TRL. Hell yeah. Because TRL was just community. Like, it was. And you got to get to know hosts. People were more humble, so they'll come on there and introduce the video, which created some sort of personal connection. Yeah. And when Pizza Hut used to have a restaurant. Bruh, and hell yeah. Like Pizza Hut had the restaurant and like they came out with the pizza. Yes. The, the, it was like something you do with your family on Fridays. Oh yeah. And the table there. And, I mean, the 90s were, it's so funny, dude, because the 90s is, is something so special. And there's a lot of ideas that I've been having about how can that be brought back. Like yeah. Certain- I love the Pizza Hut answer, man, because that's, uh, I think about Pizza Hut in the 90s a lot. I mean, the Pizza Head commercials, you remember those? Yes, yo. Pizza Head. And the soft. They used to do some dope fucking like merch collaborations. Like I have my Space Jam basketball you could buy when that movie came out and they had Casper the Ghost hand puppets. They had, yeah, yeah, Star Wars, like Star Wars episode one, like lids for your drinking shit. It was an era, man. I love that answer. Ty, man, I want to say... Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your day to do this, man. I know you don't even do a whole lot of these, so it makes it even more of a, an impact on me that you chose to take your time to do this. As I said before, you do hold a special place uh, in my heart because of the characters that I've grown up watching you play, and it's been dope to see where your journey's taken you so far. It's really a pleasure to be able to connect with you this way. I hope we stay in touch, and I hope that we work together at some point, man. So thank you again, man. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, dude. And, it's, and again, I appreciate you even connecting when you do a screen when you're younger and, and again it's all about building and i really appreciate it thank you for your time brother bet that bet that man bet that ladies and gentlemen until next time i'm all grown up psych i haven't said psych mad long oh my god that's what i'm saying i'm trying to bring that feeling back you know i'm all, I'm all, I'm all grown up psych.